I'm going to try to fast forward through this relatively rapidly. So I have no conflict of interest to report, and I'll try to decode some of the acronyms I uh, um, tested you with before, reflect on some very recent studies, and raise awareness, hopefully. And again, when we do spine surgery, it's an investment. It's an investment in our healthcare system. It's an investment in care delivery in an acute and a chronic phase and with implants, for instance. But there's also radiation investment, and not just on the part of the healthcare providers, as Dr. Wagner so eloquently pointed out, but also on the recipient, the patient, putting all this hardware in there preoperatively and through surgery. And then in the annual check x-rays for a full scoliosis, we'll invest radiation exposure to this individual. The historical context has been identified and will not be repeated, except for the fact that uh, Marie Slodowska Curie uh, had anaplastic anemia, is considered the godmother of mobile x ray units. She actually brought those into the field hospitals of the French army in World War I. And while uh, Dr. Röntgen himself, an engineer, did not die of a cancer, uh, uh, Marie Curie died of anaplastic anemia which is uh, felt to be radiation exposed. Uh, he was childless despite trying, and he destroyed all his records upon death, which is remarkable because he was a, a very amazing inventor. So invasiveness is obviously something that we're trying to improve, and I so congratulate uh, Danielle Drazen and uh, Patrick Johnson for this visionary course and putting things together. But what do we know about the true cost of MISS? We actually don't, and that also includes the radiation exposure in charting the patient's uh, bony anatomy uh, preoperatively and then through follow-up, and obviously the long-term union and reoperation, which we're still waiting for to some degree. But the true cost, I will say, in terms of the radiation exposure also is not known. Now, one study I stumbled upon I thought was really interesting. In Spain, and yes, it's Spain, it's not the US, they made a simple questionnaire to 608 patients um, in two different health districts. One was municipal, one was more rural. And again, they wanted to see what patients knew about x-rays. And this reminds me of one of those uh, late night talk show host things where they go out in the street and ask people simple questions. 42% of uh, patients in Spain did not know that CTs had radiation. The same number thought that MRIs had radiation in them. So there's a lot of ignorance in the general population, at least in Spain. Uh, a staggering almost 80% of the patients had no idea or were not informed about radiation exposure prior to tests, and that includes surgery. Uh, so I'm not sure how this would be in the U.S., but uh, I would not be surprised if our numbers were actually higher or lower, respectively. So unfortunately, uh, physicists uh, have a ball changing the terminology and, again, always changing things around uh, makes them very happy and us very chagrined. So there are a couple of uh, names that were bantered around, and again, the gray units, absorption of one joule radiation energy per kilogram matter. RADs are absorbed radiation dose, uh, again, that refers to grays. And then there's the Röntgen equivalent, uh, the REMS, and then there's a Sievert, which is now the European uh, uh, version of the metric scale. So they actually uh, mathematically correlate to REMS. But so this is kind of a little word salad, but it's important that you've heard these and know that they all relate to one another. And again, the basic thought is three grays uh, um, uh, radiation exposure creates erythema and depilation. Seven grays is permanent hair loss. That's been actually very carefully studied. There's a new term, and this you'll see in the scientific literature more and more. It's called air kerma. That's not some uh, air Nike or something like that. It's uh, energy released per unit mass from a beam of radiation in grays on a single point in X-ray field. So all the newer studies that Dr. Pauli is reviewing right now, as we're speaking, will have air kerma in it when they have radiation in them. And the second thing is DAP, D-A-P. It's the absorbed dose multiplied by the area irradiated. Did you know that, Ted? DAP and air kerma, or AK. That's the, that's the future. And then there's something else. It's called deep dose equivalent, DDE. And basically, people have figured out that the surface of our body is actually a great protective panzer. It's a great shield for alpha and beta gamma gamma uh, uh, radiation, but the actual damage uh, can, outside of the cornea, happen in the depth. And so this is actually measured as and expressed as DDE. You've seen these numbers by Dr. Wagner. I'm not going to repeat them, but basically multiple organ systems have a mathematically calculable, calculatable and differentiated uh, risk. Uh, one of the key things to point out uh, is that there are different uh, radiation exposures. Obviously, the worst is coronary angiography, which uh, by itself is very much in the realm. If you do two a year, you've basically maximized your annual exposure. What needs to be pointed out is that our bodies are actually resilient, so the amount of radiation in a time unit 
or in other words, the recovery time between radiation events is very important. If you get hit multiple times with heavy doses, that's way worse than if you have large lag times in between. But you can see that, for instance, CT of a head uh, and CT of a chest and abdomen is very different, and a chest to the abdomen is a pretty substantial radiation exposure. As we're charting patients' uh, bony anatomy in two millimeter cuts, that's a thing to worth, uh, worthwhile considering. And again, these are the basic rec uh, recommendations, 20 so-called millisievert, it's either abbreviated as SV or SI, I've seen both over five years, 50 max in one year is the absolute uh, essence, and that's an international uh, collegium. And there's uh, the three principles that I thought are worthwhile remembering. We should have a good justification for x-ray exposure, we should always optimize protection, and we should have a dose limitation. X-ray uh, exposure for residents was a great paper that I saw uh, by um, a couple of colleagues, um, and uh, Hassan Zaidi did this, and this is a very nice uh, kind of a study that actually measured prospectively um, with dosimetry uh, neurosurgery residents, and there was a cumulative increase. There are a couple of serious outliers in there that they found, which was very surprising to them. The take-home message was that in seven years of neurosurgery residency, 12.5 millisievert was the cumulative exposure. So it's something that's in, quote, acceptable occupational ranges. And obviously, that takes into consideration uh, the protective equipment, which uh, Howard Ahn so nicely summarized in his paper from 2013, which uh, Dr. Wagner just uh, uh, mentioned, and I'm just repeating that for um, in-depth uh, permeation and leaded glasses still remain the big unknown in terms of variance of quality and also utilization. All of you know the basic practical tips, uh, and we should know that the high BMO patients triple our radiation burden to surgeons intraoperatively. There's a safe distance, and again, there are a couple of tricks in terms of how to minimize your radiation exposure. Uh, these are, again, the general uh, annual exposure limits expressed in millirems uh, by the National U.S. Uh, Council on Radiation Exposure. And again, the eyes are actually very uh, radiosensitive in this regard. Uh, and these, again, are pretty clear tracking numbers. Sadly, dosimetry is not a very good way to measure this. The real numbers are probably the following. So 300 kyphoplasties a year without radiation exposure, if you calculate this, are probably acceptable, or 2,700 far lateral um, type procedures, again, without x-ray procedures. So those are actually pretty encouraging numbers from an occupational health standpoint, uh, based on Taher study from 2013. Now, new technology is arriving, and one of the key things in many of these um, uh, phenomenal new technologies that we're seeing are that we can institute higher reliability, as Daniel said in his talk, uh, instrumentation in patients with less radiation exposure or actually nil radiation exposure to the surgeons and the care providers. And again, it's fantastic to see how imaging is really reducing the radiation burden on our patients and actually provides better quality images. <clears throat> Excuse me, and I very much hope that we have similar technologies for our routine post-operative evaluations on our patients in the very near future. There was a very interesting study for me that put a little damper on this enthusiasm. It actually compared a newer type, and here's a commercial name here, a, a intraoperative a CT scanner to fluoroscopy in a very small but well-done study, 14 patients each in a matched cohort study from Taiwan. And they found, actually, that uh, the ORM had a four times higher patient radiation dose than standard fluoroscopy in their real-life study. So that was actually an important phenomenon. They did, however, notice that fluoroscopy uh, doses uh, uh, varied greatly depending upon patient size. Not a great insight. The other thing is fluoroscopy time is something that actually is irrelevant. So all of us who've recorded those faithful, I was one of those, in the past probably really did nothing much. There's a clear correlation of the radiation uh, exposure and fluoroscopy, but when you actually measure that uh, relative to fluoroscopy time, there's no meaningful statistical correlation. So all of those who compulsively recorded the fluoroscopy time can quit doing that prize. So that's a ta take-home message there. So miracles in spine happen all the time, and again, it's, I think it's so fantastic. I'm so proud to be in this specialty. And how we do this, whether we do it MIS or open, as long as we do a really good job with every patient and try to do our best to help their plight, uh, we're doing the right thing. But these miracles come at a cost. their are socioeconomic costs and their health costs for all involved, and that includes our patients. So my conclusion is the following. I think these technology upgrades are absolutely phenomenal. And I really congratulate everybody uh, to, and uh, young, uh, new leaders like uh, Daniel uh, Drazen to try to push this agenda forwards and explore its meaningful boundaries. 
hopefully the radiation burden to providers is being reduced more and more, and I, I see that happening. Hopefully we can improve patient safety, and a fact of life is that we are shifting the radiation burden right now to our patients. That's, a, I think, a very frank statement. I'd be curious to hear uh, the thought leaders' uh, uh, points on, of view on that. And the other take-home message for me is I'm pretty darn sure that our patients are unaware of their radiation burden. With that, I close. Thank you. Thank you.